Well, I think it's time that we try to start to wake up and begin to discuss and wrestle with the really big question for humanity in this century, which is how can we ensure that we will still be around in the next century and that we will reap the rewards of this enormous potential that we have to transform the human condition for the better. And I think once you start to think seriously about this, not in the sense of figuring out how you can more effectively argue your point of view to convince others, but in the sense of actually trying to figure out how it works and what we should do, you will soon realize that it's a lot more complicated than it might seem at first. But the stakes are so high that we just need to keep trying to get even that 1% increase in clarity uh, in how, how these issues might pan out. So I guess there are um, a couple of different possible paths towards extreme longevity, a biological path mm -hmm. uh, and a digital path, uh, where a biological path would mean that we would invent better uh, life extension technologies initially by maybe curing diseases, then slowing down the aging process and having a kind of open-ended but still finite biological lifespan. The digital path would be if we could develop technology eventually to do human whole brain emulation where you would create a very detailed model of a particular human brain and then emulate that in a computer where you would have an, an indefinite lifespan potentially you could make backup copies and so forth. I think in the long run the digital path is the most likely of those two. Um, the biological path might be a stopgap measure if, if one could make these kinds of breakthroughs in biogerontology. It would give a little bit of extra time for the, the people who are alive to benefit then for this digital technology to come along. But ultimately I think the potential in computing technology is far greater than that of, of biological computing matter that, that we use now to implement ourselves. So my view is that I think that more attention focused on these issues is generally uh, a good thing. Um, I think more brains being concentrated on the problem makes it more likely that we will find good solutions. Um, it's interesting to consider though the possibility that there might be instances in which information is actually harmful or dangerous. I call these information hazards where the possibility of true information or the dissemination of true information uh, can pose a risk. And a, an example of this might be if you have uh, a new way of say modifying a virus that increases its virulence and if it's very easy to do this modification. Um, and if the virus would become sufficiently dangerous then there might be a strong case that we would be better off without that information. I think that as the power of new technologies grow, our sophistication in how we deal with these information hazards will also uh, need to increase radically. Um, and partly here is a problem of coordination that uh, even if one research group holds back um, or even if one country holds back, if there is somebody else who's going to go ahead and do it anyway, it's, the cat will come out of the box. Um, so if one looks at the spectrum of existential risk, I think a fair part of that spectrum will arise from these kinds of information hazard where somebody will discover it sooner or later anyway and it's hard really to put the genie back into the bottle once it's out. And so becoming better able to deal with those things would be uh, uh, something that would, uh, I think, seriously reduce existential risk. Now, of course, some methods of doing that uh, would create existential risks on their own. In many cases there are these double-edged swords where you have something that could reduce some existential risks but at the cost of creating others. And it becomes really difficult once you start to try to figure out how this all plays out to, to even know sometimes which direction is up and which direction is down. Like even to know what would be what would be a desirable thing to be aiming for. So what always strikes me when I'm surveying the field is how many people there are who are trying to push some particular agenda and other people who are opposing them and everybody is busy either pushing or pulling on something. But few people who actually stand back and try to figure out which direction ought we to be pushing or pulling in in the first place. Um, so um, my hope would be that we will allocate slightly more of our efforts into this reflective um, 
this reflective task of trying to figure out how the different factors interact and, and which direction would be desirable to move in, um, even if it comes at the expense of going slightly slower. Right now, it seems that issues from technology risk are not at the center of the political agenda, the, like all sorts of other things, unemployment, financial crisis, terrorism, and whatnot. Um, and I th there might be many reasons for this. I mean, A, technologies tend to be developed and deployed relatively slowly and gradually over many years. It's not like suddenly there is a big explosion or a crisis. It, so, so that makes it easier to ignore this, it, that the next administration, four years hence or whatever, can deal with it. Um, also, many policymakers, at least in the West, have a background in law. They often have law degrees or sometimes from business, but they are rarely scientists or technologists. It's interesting how China is different in that regard, where in their highest um, decision-making body, until recently, every single person there was an engineer by training. And now that's no longer true. Now they have apparently one person with a law background and the rest are engineers. Whereas in the US Congress, I think there are something like a couple of people with a science background among hundreds. Uh, uh, so I think that also might sort of help shape which kinds of issues are brought to the attention. Um, and uh, um, I think it would be desirable to have more more technical competence in, in, in the highest level of governments as, as technology becomes an increasingly important shaper uh, of, 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 of human destiny. Well, I think what has tended to happen so far is that while ideas were still at the periphery, speculative, uncertain and controversial, uh, they have a special label, which might be transhumanism. And there's a small group of people discussing on the internet these new ideas. Um, as some of these ideas become adopted into the mainstream, for example, uh, the idea of in vitro fertilization for infertile couples was once very controversial. Uh, now it's common practice. Um, it's no longer seen as something distinctly transhumanist. It's just you know something that you do unless you particularly have a big objection to that. Uh, and I think that that's going to be the general tendency for things that one, while they're still new and speculative and alien, they might have a special label and particular strange people who are promoting and discussing them. But once they enter common practice, I think uh, that label will no longer be seen as particularly illuminating and it, it will just enter the normal political give and take. And I think it's probably a healthy thing for it to be like that. Um, I think sometimes these ideological labels can polarize people uh, and make it harder to, to make the, the nuanced uh, distinctions that, that ultimately are necessary if you, when, when you actually start using something in, in the real world. Um, you need to, everything is more complicated than it initially looks like it should be once you try to put it into practice. And at that point, I think the, the big banners might, might sort of have, have lost their purpose. So um, one might look at perhaps analog. So the environmental movement has generated political parties in many countries, green parties, um, where the root was a particular kind of concern. It's for the environment. And then they've had to adapt, adopt, uh, develop a more general sort of set of issues and policy and other things. And, and it's possible that something similar could happen with, with transhumanist concerns. Um, but probably what there would have to be first is a larger sort of popular movement and interest in these issues that might then create the ground from which somebody could politically organize and, and create a sort of more formal political structure on top of that. Um, and um, I think may, may, maybe that maybe that maybe that could work. Um, it, it's hard to to predict how these kinds of political realities will play out. One concept that is useful, I think, in thinking about long-term futures for humanity is the notion of a singleton, which would be a world order where, at the highest level of organization, 
there is only one decision-making entity. Um, now, that decision-making entity could be any of a wide range of different structures. It could be sort of a world democratic government, it could be a dictator, it could be a super intelligent machine, it could be some perhaps even universal moral code that uh, had provisions for its own enforcement. Like both good and bad structures could count as a singleton, but the unifying um, feature would be that they would all have the ability to solve global coordination problems. Um, for example, to avoid arms races or to uh, solve these global commons problems, like when you have uh, different countries spewing out pollutants into the atmosphere or overfishing the oceans. So there are all these kinds of coordination problems that arise from the lack of a single decision-making entity at the top. And the future scenarios for for humanity might sort of be grouped into whether they involve the creation of a singleton, which could then solve these coordination problems or not, where you would have some kind of uh, competitive scenario. Um, and I think that, well, the singleton scenarios could be either very good or very bad, but provided you had a singleton that adequately represented the interests of the different parts that participated in it. it. It might be something that could reduce existential risk by, by eliminating some of these um, uh, failures of coordination that, that could result in dangerous arms races, for example. Um, and it, it seems maybe unrealistic today because we are so far from that kind of unified world. But if one takes a long historic view over this, there has been an increasing scale of political integration through human history. We started out as hunter-gatherers where there were bands of maybe 40 or 60 people and that, that was the largest entity of organization. Then we had larger tribes, um, we had city-states um, like in ancient Greece, then larger nations and now we have regional enterprises like the European Union and and some global organizations that increasingly weave together the world in partial waves like World Trade Organization, the UN is weak but it's more than nothing. Um, so if one extrapolates this from tribe to city-state to uh, nation to EU then you know, th the logical culmination of that would be a, a single ton. Um, so I think over a longer time span it, it remains one of the more like well it, it remains fairly likely perhaps more likely than not that humanity will one way or another end up as a single time.